Our foundational text today will be coming from the Old Testament book of Genesis chapter 41. And I want to start with verse 1. Two years later, Pharaoh had a dream and he was standing beside the Nile when seven healthy looking, well-fed cows came up from the Nile and began to graze among the reeds. And after them, seven other cows, sickly, thin, came up from the Nile, and they stood beside those cows along the bank of the Nile. The sickly, thin cows ate the healthy, well-fed cows. And then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep and dreamed a second time. Seven heads of grain, plump and ripe, came up on one stalk. And then seven heads of grain, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven plump, ripe ones. And then Pharaoh woke up, and it was only a dream. And when morning came, he was troubled. So he summons all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but no one could interpret them for him. And then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I remember my faults. Pharaoh had been angry with his servants, and he put me and the chief baker in the custody of the captain of the guard. And he and I had dreams on the same night. Each dream had its own meaning. And now a young Hebrew, a slave of the captain of the guards, was with us there. And we told him our dreams, and he interpreted our dreams for us, and each had its own interpretation. It turned out just the way he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was hanged. And then Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and they quickly brought him from the dungeon. He shaved, changed his clothes, and went to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said about you that you can hear a dream and interpret it. I'm not able to do it, Joseph answered Pharaoh. It is God who will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Let's stop there. It's interesting when we read this text, we see so often that what is happening here is that Joseph has now been forgotten in prison for two years by the man who he interpreted a dream for, and it was a cupbearer. And Joseph simply said, when you get back to Pharaoh, remember me so that I can be released for a crime that I did not commit. Two years later, he is released. Two years later, he now stands in the palace of Egypt. Two years later, it's amazing what God is doing in the circumstances. But all along the hardship and trials and temptations, Joseph remained faithful to God. Now, throughout my tenure of going to Sunday school and vacation Bible school... I had always been taught this was the high point of Joseph's life. That Joseph now is about to be the second in command of Egypt. (coughs) I had always been taught that now is when Joseph is going to receive the blessings that are going to be due to him. How many of you have heard that before? This is Joseph when he's going to be put on the center stage and be blessed beyond measure. Well, today, I want to shatter that for you. I want to shatter that idea completely. This is probably not the high point of Joseph's life. This is the lowest point of Joseph's life. See, Joseph is about to be taken to Pharaoh. And while Joseph is being taken to Pharaoh, there's a couple things that are going to be happening before he gets to Pharaoh. Joseph is a Hebrew. He's a believer in one God, Yahweh. But now what happens before he can get in the presence of Pharaoh, they make him shave his head and shave his beard, something that would not have been done by a Jewish person. He has been made to change his clothes so that he can be presentable in front of Pharaoh. My friends, this is not 
a joyful time for Joseph. Yes, he leaves the prison. Yes, he is going to be shaved. Yes, he will have on clean clothes and go before Pharaoh. But I want to present to you this idea. Egypt was trying to change the outside of Joseph, but had forgotten that God had already changed the inside. You'll get that at lunch. <coughs> Egypt was trying to change this man of God and offer him so much. Here what we find out is this. <coughs> I apologize for the cough. We find out that when the king Pharaoh has these dreams, that it finally hits who can interpret them? And it's only one person. For it says all the sorcerers, all the magicians, all the wise men, they all failed in Egypt. But how many of you know that when man fails, God does not? And so at that point, the cupbearer finally remembers that this guy can do it named Joseph. And in remembering that, it was because God had allowed Joseph to remain in prison for those two years that God was teaching Joseph about perseverance. Whenever Joseph does get there, Pharaoh says, I understand that you're able to interpret dreams, that you're able to give the right meaning for them. Joseph does not take the credit. Did you notice that? Joseph says, no, I'm not able to do that. But God is. He does not acknowledge the God of Pharaoh, which would have been the sun god at that time. He does not acknowledge any of the Egyptian deities. He acknowledges the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one God. And he acknowledges that God, our God, and says, it is only God who can do this. And so he gives the interpretation. He says that you're going to have seven good years. That's what the seven healthy cows are. Seven good years and everything's going to be bountiful, plentiful. It's going to be great. Stock market's going to be up. Everything's going to be wonderful. But then after that, it will be seven years that everything is going to be horrible. And so Joseph says, here's what you should do. You should store up and you should get prepared for the seven bad years and you'll have seven good years to do that. And once you do that, then everyone in the world will come to you to buy grain. And it will bless Egypt in such a great way. <coughs> Pharaoh is impressed by this. And Pharaoh, he exalts Joseph because he realizes what Joseph says is truly a message from God. Even though Pharaoh is not a believer in Yahweh and the God we serve he still acknowledges that this was a message from God. Because if you remember, everywhere Joseph had been, blessings were always around him. He was blessed in Potiphar's house. He was blessed in the prison. Now he is in the palace and blessings are going to happen for Pharaoh. Anyone that's around him, blessings are going to take place. A little side note, if we can just take a detour and get back on the main point of the message... If you are an employer, hire Christian people because Christian people are supposed to work for their employer as they are working for the Lord. So they should be bringing blessings to you. And if you're a Christian, work for that person that has paying you as if you're working for the Lord. Why? It's because you will be not bringing blessings on your effect, but you'll be pointing to God. And how many young people today, and, and even not so young, forget that principle of doing something for someone else because they're doing it to bring glory to God. So what do we see here? We see Joseph stands here with a shaved head, a shaved beard, a different clothes on. And after he gives this announcement of what has taken place, you'll notice that Pharaoh in verse 37 of our text, it says, The proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find anyone like this, a man who has God's spirit in him? A pagan recognizes God's spirit is in this Hebrew whenever his own family didn't recognize it. Don't miss that point. That the outside world, people that are not even believers, sometimes have, do you realize they can look at you and point out really quick if you're really a follower of Christ? You know, we get around each other and sometimes we, we blend in like the chameleon, right? We blend in. But someone that's not a believer, we get around them and the way we joke and talk and then we invite them to church and they look at us like we're insane and say, oh, you go to church? 
how embarrassing that would be for someone to even question, do we go to church? Because we act like the world. Does that make sense to any of you? And then it says here that he notices, this pagan king notices God's spirit is in him. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as intelligent as wise as you. Verse 40, you will be over my house and over my people. You will obey, my people will obey your commands. Only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. This is unheard of. This is a foreigner, a slave, who is now the second in command of the most powerful nation in the world. And what is happening here? It is not what God intended to be happening at first. Because why? God intended for what to be blessed? His promised land to be blessed. Not Egypt. Egypt is the bad guys. Do you see what happens? Is Joseph rejected by his own people. They would not bow to him. But now it says that the Egyptians will willingly bow to him. Do you remember the dream that Joseph had? That's what got him thrown in the pit and hated by his brothers because he told them a dream. He said, one day you will bow to me. And it was a dream that God had given him. And they said, oh, this arrogant Joseph. And they hated him for it. And now what's taking place? A pagan people are willing to bow down to this Hebrew whenever his own people were not willing to acknowledge him. And then it continues. It says that he will be over all of these things. He will only be second to Pharaoh. In verse 41, Pharaoh also said to Joseph, See, I am placing you over all the land of Egypt. What was God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? They would be over all the promised land. Is Egypt the promised land? The answer to that is no. This was not what God was doing. God, yes, put Joseph and allow these things to happen. But do you not see that even though Joseph is going to be over all of Egypt, his destiny was not to be there. As in fact, it was to be what God wanted in his own land. But then it continues. Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand. Now, when I said this is one of the lowest points of Joseph's life, here's when it's really about to happen. So if you want to challenge that thought, here's where you would challenge me at. Why I believe, based on my study of Scripture, based on my knowledge of Jewish tradition, why I believe this is probably the most breaking point of Joseph's life is right here in this Scripture. It says this, Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand. And he put it on Joseph's hand. Do you know whose ring should have been on Joseph's hand? Jacob's. Folks, don't miss that. He's now wearing the ring of a pagan leader when he should have had on whose ring? His daddy's ring. Jacob's, right? But why didn't he have on Jacob's ring? Because his family rejected him, sold him into slavery. And now look what, God has put him where he needs to be, yes, to, to survive and to, to do what I'm about to show you in a few moments later, to redeem his people. But the thing I want to show you is how sad it is when that ring goes on his hand. Don't you know that Joseph is thinking about what ring used to be on that hand? When you think about it, how sad it is. And then look at the next thing. Don't overlook what it says. He clothed him with a fine linen garment. Joseph once had a fine garment. Do you remember that? It was a coat of many colors with long sleeves. And it told the whole community that Joseph was in charge of his family. Joseph had that stripped off of him. And now Joseph's wearing a pagan fine garment. Do you see what's happening? Satan so many times tries to replace what God originally gives us, but it will never be a true blessing. You see, Joseph is wearing some other man's ring. He's now wearing some other man's clothes. And then it says that he places a gold chain around his neck. In verse 43, he had Joseph ride in the second chariot and servants called out to him, Ebark, 
And what that means in the Egyptian is to kneel. The servants call out, kneel! And guess what they did? They didn't fuss about it. They kneeled. Why? Joseph looks like one of them. His head is shaved. His face is shaved. He's dressed like an Egyptian. And if you didn't know it, you would have thought he was an Egyptian. But what made Joseph different? It was not the outside. What made Joseph different was even though they changed the ring on his hand, put a different coat on his body, shaved his head, Joseph was still the same man on the inside. Folks, I will tell you this. Sometimes we see people that have been saved and they are tattooed up from head to toe and they look like something off of a magazine that we say, oh my gracious, what in the world is going on there? But it's not the outside. You can change the outside all you want. It is the inside. Don't allow the inside to change. And here, he had not done that. He had not allowed what was on the inside to change. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. But no one will be able to rise his hand or foot in all of the land of Egypt without your permission. And Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zeremnath Paniah and gave him a wife. Now stop there for a second. You might say, oh, this is great. Joseph has now got a gold chain, got on fancy clothes, got a good ring on his hand, and even got a different name. Why are we saying this is the high point of Joseph's life? Joseph's name, which was a Hebrew name, has been now changed to a pagan name. We don't celebrate whenever in the book of Daniel the four Hebrew children's names were changed. Now when we talk about the ones that were thrown in the fire, the three that were thrown in the fire, we don't never call them by their Hebrew names. We always call them by their pagan names. Have you ever noticed that? Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, that's not their Hebrew names. That's their pagan names. Why don't we call Joseph his pagan name? I would like to attest to you is that nowhere in this time of this story here, even though they changed his name, changed his clothes, they did not change him. Did they? You let people call you all they want, call, call you any name they want, say anything they want to say about you, but it sucks on the inside. Don't let that change. Let's continue. Changes his name. He gives him a wife, but not just any wife, gives him an Egyptian wife. What was God's command to his people? Don't take pagan wives. And what now is Joseph forced to do? To take a pagan wife. But the inside had not changed. Let me prove this to you that the inside had not changed, even though he had taken a pagan wife. In verse 46, it says, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So when he was sold into slavery, do you remember how old he was? He was 17. So now he's been in a pagan land for how many years? 13 years. Don't overlook that. This didn't just happen. This is a 13-year journey. It says he's there now in the Pharaoh's house. And it says Joseph left Pharaoh's presence. He traveled throughout the land. Well, later on you'll find out in verse 51 is that Joseph and his pagan wife have a child. Well, since Joseph is the head of his house, he gets to name this child. He not only has one child, but they have two children. And he names them. And I want to prove to you that even though the clothes changed, the haircut changed, and the ring changed. I want to prove to you this. The inside didn't change. Because when he went to name his children, guess what he named them? He did not name them pagan names. You would think he's the second command in Egypt, so what would you naturally do? You've been around these pagans for 13 years. You're going to name your kids pagan names, so when they go to pagan schools, they'll be associated with their pagan friends. Joseph doesn't do that. You know why? Joseph on the inside is still a follower of Yahweh. And he names his children this, Manasseh and Ephraim. He names them Manasseh, and let's look at that. The first in verse 51, it says that he named his firstborn Manasseh. And then here it says why. It says, God has made me forget all my hardships in my father's house. Notice what he does there. Notice all his hardships. Manasseh. 
Whenever he calls on his son and the son's out in the field or the son's doing something in the palace and he calls his son Manasseh, every Egyptian that hears the name of that, even though Joseph's name was changed to be a pagan name, Pharaoh didn't, couldn't change or name his child, name Joseph's child. So Joseph gives his child a Hebrew name. Why? Because he wanted that Hebrew name to be heard. And what did it mean? He says he forgot all his hardships. So let me put it this way. Manasseh in our modern day translation would be mean this. I let that stuff go. I have let that stuff go. What did he let go? Well, I'm glad you asked. By naming his son Manasseh, he was saying, I let my brother's hatred towards me go. I ask you today, have you let the hatred that someone's had towards you go? Have you had a Manasseh experience? I hope you're writing this now. Manasseh means let it go. He let that go. He let, when they threw him in the pit, go. Do you think he harbored on that? No. He let, when he was in Potiphar's house, remember what Potiphar's wife did? She accused him of rape. But he says, Manasseh, I've let it go. He let being in prison whenever the cupbearer forgot to tell Pharaoh until two years later about him. Joseph is actually saying, Manasseh, I have let it go. He's let all this go. He's let it go. Why? It's because if you harbor on the past and hold on to grudges, the only person that will be defeated in that situation is yourself. It is as if you are a boxer in the ring and instead of your opponent hitting you, you take your gloves and begin to hit yourself. How silly that would be. But when we harbor hate in our lives, it is as if we are performing a Manasseh. We are not letting it go. The first thing I want to ask you, what in your life do you need to let go? Anything? Secondly, he names the second son what? Ephraim. And what does that mean? God has made me fruitful in the land of my afflictions. If anyone tries to say to you, this is Joseph's high point. Say to him, why did he name his son Ephraim? God has made me fruitful in the land of my what? Afflictions. If you're in a good place, is that your land of your affliction? No. Affliction means what? Trouble, hardship, pain, suffering. But you, wait a minute, Pastor. You just said Joseph's second in command. Everyone's bowing down to him. There's no trouble, no hardship, no pain, no suffering. Yes, there is. Where is it at? On the inside. Because every time Joseph had to look at his reflection, he sees a shaved head. He sees a ring on his hand that did not belong to him. He should have had Jacob's ring on. He sees a robe on him that it should not have been his. It should have been Jacob's robe on him. He sees all these things around him, these people that have bowed down to them. It should not have been them. It should have been his brothers. But he says, God still blessed me in the land of my hardship. So it brings me to this point. If you've had a Manasseh experience and you're going to let things go... Will you also realize that the land you're living in, I don't care if you live in Atkinson, Pender County, or where at, this is a place of hardship, a place of suffering, because you will get sick, you will die, you will have pain, you will have your feelings hurt, you will have all of this happening. And the question is today is that will you focus in on the other land? We're going to another place. And we're going there because we've been redeemed. Let me wrap everything up with this. It is my belief that even though all of this takes place, it takes place because God is still in control. God knew that by choosing Joseph to have such a task, that Joseph, even though the outside changed, and by everyone's thought process, you would think that Joseph himself had changed, but Joseph had not. We learned that by the way he named his children, and we learned that later the way he treats his brothers. Now, in chapter 42, when we get to that, you're going to be amazed that Jacob, when they find out there's grain and there's food, that the famine's taking place, that they find out that Egypt's willing to sell this to foreigners, and Jacob sends 10 of his sons. But guess what? He doesn't send Joseph's biological brother. Joseph had a brother, and what was his name? Benjamin. They had the same mother. They had These two boys had the same mother. Remember, because Jacob had four wives. They had the same mother. 
Jacob doesn't send them. You know why? It's because Jacob doesn't trust, and he doesn't trust because the last time he sent his beloved son with these ten boys, what did they come back with? They come back with a bloody coat saying that now their son's dead. Why would you want to send your wife who you loved, your, that wife that you worked for, coveted for, why would you want to send now the only child that you think is left with these ten boys? They still won't trust it. But you know what? When they get there, you'll find this out, is that Joseph still is willing to show forgetfulness and love and let it go and show that compassion to them. Today the message is clear. The message is this. No matter what changes on the outside, don't change on the inside. Don't change who you are. I've had friends who have changed their hairstyles thinking it will make them be a different person. Haven't you seen that? Change the way they dress. That will make them feel different. Change what they drive. You know, you get a certain age and they call it midlife crisis and you buy a sports car. I don't know what midlife is. I mean, I'm not counting down the last days. I'm waiting for my neighbor across the street. When he drives up in a Lamborghini, I'll know that that's midlife crisis. <laughs> but you see where I'm coming at. Well, you can change all the outside, but how many of you know it's the inside, right? Joseph never changed the inside. Let's pray.